Hi, I'm Carlton Coffrin, and in this video I'm going to tell you about our recent experience using the D-Wave 2X quantum computer. One of the views of the D-Wave computer is an optimization tool for solving binary quadratic programs, which are often called BQPs or QBOs in the literature. Now regardless of what you want to call them, these are NP-hard combinatorial optimization problems, which makes them quite interesting from both a scientific and computational perspective. Now, combinatorial optimization is nothing new. This has been a thriving area of research and development for at least 50 years. If you're interested, I would recommend taking a look at In Pursuit of the Traveling Salesman, a chronicle of how that problem has been improved over many decades, or go to Coursera and take the discrete optimization course to learn about how these problems are solved in practice. Now, the interesting fact is that after controlling for hardware speed up of computers, these algorithmic R&D developments from 1993 to 2013 resulted in over 500,000 times speed up in the ability to solve these particular problems. So this R&D effort is really bringing significant improvements to this area. Now, this raises a very interesting open question. How do these state-of-the-art tools compare to the D-Wave hardware? Now, if it was the case that the D-Wave hardware was significantly outperformed these state-of-the-art tools, that would be a really big deal because it would mean that this hardware has effectively outpaced uh, decades of research in this particular area. So in this talk, we're going to take a first step towards answering this question. It's by no means the, the end of the story, it's just the beginning of this particular story. Before I can explain how we do our comparison, it's helpful to understand the optimization landscape. Essentially, there are solvers, which are basically algorithms for solving these particular problems. Here's a collection of different algorithms. And then there are benchmark libraries, which contain lots of different problems which are of interest to the community. When you want to compare two solvers, you run them on one particular benchmark library and then measure their performance. You might take a different set of solvers and run them on a different set of benchmarks to measure their performance as well. In any event, these lead to plots like this one, which compare a bunch of different solvers on a consistent set of test cases to see how they perform, usually in terms of runtime. So our observation was that the QP-LID benchmark set contains some problems that the D-Wave can solve natively. They're these binary quadratic programming type of problems. So our idea was to run these BQP-LID on the D-Wave 2X hardware and compare it to the off-the-shelf state-of-the-art solver, Gorobi. Effectively, we're going to do Gorobi versus D-Wave and produce a comparison plot like this. Now, I have to confess, there's going to be a lot of negative results in this particular um, presentation, but I want to tell you that I've truly fallen in love with this particular hardware as a result of this project. I think it's very fascinating and has a lot of potential, so don't let any negative results discourage you from taking a look at and experimenting with the D-Wave computer. So this is the basic approach. The QP-LID is stored in .gams files. Uh, so we load those into our own native data structures for binary quadratic programs, and then we can send them off to Gorobi through Gorobi Solver API, or off to the D-Wave hardware via the uh, SAPI API. And, and then both of those output solutions in the exact same format so we can easily compare um, the solution on a common basis. Now the first big question is how many of these QP-LIB instances will fit into the D-Wave? The QP-LIB falls into the class of mixed integer quadratically constrained quadratic programs, where the D-Wave can solve binary quadratic programs. So it's a significant subset of the total QP-LIB's uh, possible problem space. And on top of solving just binary quadratic programs, D-Wave programs have to fit onto this particular um, chimera graph of a particular chip, which is also restrictive in the type of uh, interactions that the variables can have. So this is a mathematical representation of what the QP-LIB can represent uh, with different an objective function and constraints and variables. And this is a mathematical representation of what the D-Wave computer can represent. Now you can see that there are some similarities between these, but clearly the QP-LIB supports additional features that the D-Wave does not. And the D-Wave has this additional restriction that the 
uh, variable interactions have to be in this chimera graph. Now, it turns out that uh, testing, if this is the case, is an NPR problem. So instead of doing that, we're just going to put in some sufficient conditions for a problem to fit into this hardware. Namely, the number of uh, variables should be less than 1,000, and the number of edges should be less than 3,000. So if we start with the 479 test cases in the QP-Lib, and we start reducing them to see which ones will fit into the D-Wave, we can begin by removing all of the cases that have real or integer variables. This removes 350 of the possible cases. Then we can remove cases which have any kind of constraints in them. So that removes 87 more cases. Now we can add in the restriction that the edges should be less than 3,000, that removes 23, and the restriction that the, no, the number of variables should be less than 1,000, that re removes two more cases. So now we have 17 cases that remain. So the second question we need to ask ourselves is, are these 17 cases interesting? Are they hard problems? It could be the case that by doing this filtering, we've actually reduced the QP-Lib to just a small collection of easy problems. And before I can explain to you um, if these are hard problems or not, we need to understand a little bit about how a classic optimization tool like Garobi works. In this plot, we have runtime on the x-axis. That's how much time the algorithm has been running for. And then on the y-axis, we have the solution cost. Our goal will be to make the solution cost as little as possible. So as the algorithm is running, you have a property like this. There's a best solution which is found by the algorithm, and it's constantly decreasing because we're trying to push the cost to be as low as possible. Then these algorithms also compute another valuable piece of information called a lower bound, which uh, bounds the cheapest possible solution you could ever have. And this is always increasing as time goes on. So eventually, you, these two values will converge, and you will have an optimality proof that you, the best solution you found is, in fact, the global optimum solution. Now, the problem is that this runtime could be exponentially long. Uh, so we're usually not uh, wanting to wait for it to converge. So we'll set a time limit, for example, for one hour and we'll stop it before these two uh, lines can meet each other. But then we can measure the optimality gap. And this gives us a measure of how far away we are from the best possible solution we could ever have. Still very valuable information. So let's look at the results of these 17 cases when we put them into Garobi. The good news, uh, so what you're seeing here is first the case identifiers, then the number of variables in each case, the number of interactions between multiple variables, which is the edge set, the best solution found, the optimality gap when a time limit of one hour has been reached, and then the total runtime before convergence. So the good news is for this collection, uh, uh, interesting subset of these, these are very challenging problems, uh, which would be quite fascinating if the D-Wave hardware could solve these. So we're very excited we have some hard problems. Now, before I can show you the D-Wave results, we need to understand a little bit more about how you get a problem into the D-Wave machine to be able to interpret what they mean. So the first thing we need to understand is that um, the D-Wave hardware does not actually solve a binary quadratic program as pictured on the left. It solves what's called an Ising model, which is pictured on the right, where the variables take values minus 1 and 1. Fortunately, there's a simple linear transform which can move a binary quadratic program into an Ising model and back. So this actually presents no significant difficulty. The second thing to know is that in preparing the problem, we have a source graph, which is given by the particular binary quadratic programming instance, and we need to embed it into the hardware graph of the D-Wave chip as pictured on the right. So we need to f basically map this particular graph into another particular graph. And this it should raise a big warning because doing this kind of graph embedding problem is NP-hard, and turns out to be quite a challenging problem. Another important thing to know about when you're embedding in a D-Wave hardware is that the source graph might have an arbitrary interaction with other variables uh, in the problem. So for example, in this case, x1 interacts with eight other variables because it's eight outgoing edges. Where on the right, the target graph only has six edges. This is just a limitation of the current generation of the hardware. So how do we uh, encode a problem with more than six edges? We use a technique 
where you duplicate a particular variable, so you'd make spin1 and spin1 prime, and then you would add a chain link between them that says these two values should take on, these two variables should take on the exact same value, and using this particular topology, you can encode an eight edge interaction um, across other variables by linking two of them together. Now, it's important, this should raise another warning because this means that some of these chains could be broken. And this leads to infeasible solutions in our source problem because they, these variables were not replicated in the original problem. So, to, uh, to review, this is basically how you get a problem into the D-Wave computer. First, you take your binary quadratic program, you convert it to an Ising model, then you run this embedding algorithm to somehow fit it on the hardware, and that's a big warning because that's NP-hard. You, then you send it off to the hardware, it works, and then it comes back to you, and then you have to unembed it, and this is also another warning step because it can cause infeasible solutions if some of the chains were broken. Then you uh, take your Ising problem you can solution, you convert it back to a binary quadratic programming solution, and then you output that in the exact same format as the input. So here's the table we had before with Garobi. If we add in the D-Wave results, this is what they look like. So what you're seeing here is first the best solution that was found uh, by 10,000 samples on the D-Wave machine. Uh, the num number of times which that particular solution was found out of 10,000 samples, and then out of 10,000 samples, how many of those were infeasible solutions. In the last column, we have the total runtime, where the first number is the time that the embedding algorithm took, plus the second number is the time to run on the particular chip. The time to run on the chip is roughly constant because we're always going to use the whole chip and we're always going to take 10,000 samples. And it's about four seconds, including going all the way out over the internet to talk to the machine and coming back. Now, there are, there are some special pieces of information. FE indicates that the embedding step of the algorithm failed, and TL indicates that we hit a time limit of one hour. So the issue we have here is that for small problems, the D-Wave produces results that are very comparable to Garobi, but for all of the problems which are challenge, significantly challenging for Garobi, the embedding task fails, and so we don't have any particular insight into how these problems would perform on the hardware, assuming we could get it in there. But as we all know, if you fail, the best thing to do is try again. So we took a look at a different set of test cases. These are the Dimax Max Cleek cases. So why did we look at Max Cleek? Well, the first thing is that there's a formulation on the complement graph, which is a super sparse problem. So it should be very easy to embed, uh, which would be great. Another aspect is that this is a combinatorial optimization problem. So it doesn't have, um, floating point coefficients, so there's going to be minimal issues with accuracy of the hardware. And last but not least, it's easy to generate max quick test cases, so we can basically scale them up in difficulty uh, to exactly see where the, the challenge points lie for the different algorithms. So here are some max quick cases uh, that we generated. The last two come from the Dimax uh, cases, and these are the particular results. Now, uh, interestingly, as you get up to, say, a graph with 100 or 200 nodes, Garobi tends to be, the problems start to get difficult, to, difficult for Garobi. Um, and for small cases, like the ones pictured here, the D-Wave is producing very similar results to Garobi, so that's very good. It's finding the optimal solution in almost all the cases. But the problem is, for these cases where it's actually a difficult problem, the embedder fails again, and we're not able to analyze what the quality of the D-Wave would be on problems which are challenging for Garobi. So, if you fail twice, what can you do? You can try, try again. Hopefully the third time's the charm. So, we came to another idea, which is essentially building a best case scenario for the D-Wave hardware. What we're gonna do is design a problem on the D-Wave QPU chip so that we don't need to do any embedding at all and there are no chains, so nothing can be infeasible. Then we're only going to use coefficients of minus one or one so that there's no accuracy issues. This is really the best possible scenario for this particular hardware. So what you're seeing here is the, a particular chip where the color of the edges indicate 
um, the values minus one or one of the particular instance. In this case, all of the edges are encoded as negative values. If you put this into the this particular chip, it's going to come back with a value of minus 4168 99% of the time, and it only takes 10 seconds to get all 10,000 of those samples. Now, if you put this into Garobi, it's going to give you the exact same quality solution and prove that it's the optimal solution in less than one second. So that didn't work out so well. We also looked at a checkerboard pattern that looks like this. Um, and if you put this into the D-Wave computer, again, you get minus 4168 um, 99% of the time, and it only takes four seconds to do that. But again, you get minus 4168 and a 0% optimality gap with Garobi for this particular pattern. So we tried a more challenging test case, which we call a frustrated checker pattern. And in this case, the D-Wave gives us 30 uh, 70 as the best solution, but only about 50% of the time, indicating that it's a bit of a harder problem in about four seconds. But again, Garobi can produce a 0% gap in less than one second. So at this point, I was really exhausted because I just couldn't find a problem on the D-Wave chip that was actually quite interesting and challenging for Garobi. So I did what I always do when I feel like this, and I went to bathtub row to get a pint of beer and just think it all over. Now, it was very fortunate for me because this day that I went to the pub, I happened to bump into three of my friends from the theoretical division, and they had a very interesting uh, question. They asked me if I had ever tried a so-called glassy problem on this particular hardware, and I knew nothing about that, and they proceeded to teach me all about interesting Ising models. So this led me to try what is called the RAND1 case. In this case, for every edge in the chip, you randomly pick if its value is minus one or one, and it produces this particular graph. So when I put this into the D-Wave, it got minus 1894, 67 uh, times out of 10,000, which indicates it's a very difficult problem to optimize. And when I put it into Garobi, even after one hour of computation, it was only able to find a 1838 quality solution, and it was only able to show that that's within 9.9% of the global optimal solution. So this was a very big deal. Here is a case where um, the D-Wave can actually find a higher quality solution than Garobi can in less than one hour. So I decided to make a family of RAND1 instances. So we start with a very small chimera graph of size one, and then we grow it to size two, and then size three, all the way up to size 12, which would be the entire chip. And we can compare the performance of Garobi and D-Wave on these variety of different sizes of RAND1 problems. So here are the results of scaling this RAND1 problem. Now, uh, for the small problems, both solvers do quite well. Uh, and produce very similar results. But the cases get interesting right around C6 or C7. This is when we see that it's getting more difficult for Garobi to find the global optimal solution. And uh, the D-Wave is able to find that solution or a better one in just five seconds. So especially for these last three cases with the C10 to 12, uh, we can actually see pretty significant improvements over the best solution found by Garobi. Um, even after one hour of computation. And keep in mind that this basically just takes five seconds. We don't have any time um, for the embedding algorithm. We don't need to do an embedding, but the actually it doesn't matter how big the problem is. It takes about the same amount of time to get it out of the D-Wave machine. So in concluding and looking to the future, I would say at this point, I've really drunk the D-Wave Kool-Aid. Uh, this RAN1 instance has convinced me that the D-Wave 2X chip has some real potential and is a very interesting platform to do science on. But one of the key issues is that this potential is currently inaccessible on classical benchmarks, in large part due to this challenge of how do you embed a, a traditional benchmark onto the D-Wave hardware. So to unlock this potential, I can see that we need uh, potentially three thrusts of research, and it's very interesting multidisciplinary research. We need some physics to come, physicists to come to the table and develop a functional form of what this chip is doing so that we can understand exact, more precisely what its properties are. Then we need to bring in computer scientists to do, make significant progress on this embedding algorithm so we can get problems that we're quite interested in onto the hardware. And last but not least, 
we need to bring optimization researchers to the table to figure out how to incorporate this subprocessor into classic algorithms, which aren't used to having an oracle, which can just give a very good solution to a fairly big binary quadratic program. So I'll just conclude with some special thanks. I would very much like to thank the Information Science Technology Institute at Los Alamos for sponsoring this work, and also to Misa Cherkov for um, having a very interesting conversation with me that inspired me to apply for the money to do this project.